This is going to be uh, uh, a continued series as we are working through uh, the theme of bearing witness and certainly hoping and praying that this will also be relevant somewhat in uh, our theme for today, uh, knowing and believing that we are called in this season to bear witness, to bear witness of a God who is not absent. Hello, somebody of a God who is very much present with us, uh, a God who has always reminded us that there is no situation that God cannot intervene, handle, support, sustain us through. And uh, I do hope and pray that this passage of Scripture will be a great blessing to us. It is about uh, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, These are three uh, young uh, brothers who were taken into captivity uh, by the Babylonian Empire and a fanatical king and ruler by the name of Nebuchadnezzar uh, was very much attempting to break their will, the will of the people, uh, through all kinds of different things. And we talked a little bit about uh, the many ways that the Daniel fast. So Daniel was one of the friends of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So the Daniel fast actually comes out of these uh, collection of stories, out of these collection of texts. And so uh, we're going to spend a few moments uh, just reading and talking a little bit about this passage and how I think it calls us to bear witness. Daniel chapter 3, verse number 1. If you have it, say, I got it. All right, you can follow along on the screen as well, and uh, we can uh, get through this story. The band started to play, a huge band equipped with all the musical instruments of Babylon, and everyone, every race, color, and creed fell to their knees and worshiped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Just then, some Babylonian fortune tellers stepped up and accused the Jews. And they said to King Nebuchadnezzar, long live the king. You gave strict orders, O king, that when the big band started playing, Everyone had to fall to their knees and worship the gold statue. And whoever did not go to their knees and worship it had to be pitched into a roaring furnace. Well, there are some Jews here, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have placed in high positions in the province of Babylon. These men are ignoring you, O king. They don't respect your gods, and they won't worship the gold statue you set up. Furious, King Nebuchadnezzar ordered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be brought in. When the men were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar asked, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you don't respect my gods and refuse to worship the gold statue that I have set up? I'm giving you a second chance. But from now on, when the big band strikes up, you must go to your knees and worship the statue I have made if you don't worship it. You will be pitched into a roaring furnace. No questions asked. Who is the God who can rescue you from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered King Nebuchadnezzar, Your threats mean nothing to us. If you throw us in the fire, the God we serve can rescue us from your roaring furnace and anything else you might cook up, O king. But even if God doesn't, it wouldn't make a bit of difference, O king. We still wouldn't serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you set up. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to talk for a few moments simply from the topic, refuse to bow. Refuse to bow. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide these words in our heart. So we will not sin against you, and please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon the hearers and even me, the preacher. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Give your neighbor a quick high five and tell them, I refuse to bow. I refuse. Now, of course, the month of February is uh, deemed Black History Month. Uh, I think it was Carter G. Woodson uh, who actually uh, began to put this month aside as an effort to recapture a very uh, monolithic 
history that was being told by the oppressor in this country of the, the contributions that uh, descendants of African slaves, black folk in America made to the very kind of uh, thriving and, 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 and uh, positivity, emerging positivity, whether it's justice or arts, et cetera, uh, in this country. And, and uh, Black History Month has become, I think, not just an important conversation about the contribution of black folk just very locally uh, in social society, but I hope you and I appreciate that the struggle for liberation uh, of African descendants of African slaves in this country uh, was very much grounded in the churches and the religious communities uh, where African folks gathered. That it wasn't just this sense that the struggle for liberation was done by civil rights people that were not situated inside an incubating power of Christian faith and struggle against the forces of evil. Uh, if I were to pull some names uh, from the tradition of the black uh, church uh, during this season of black history, names like Frederick Douglass would come to mind. Uh, names like Denmark Vesey would come to mind. Denmark Vesey was one of these uh, freedom-fighting pastors, if you will, reverends out of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the AME Church, uh, that uh, pastored Mother Bethel in South Carolina, in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, many of you may recognize that name, Mother Bethel, because it is the church that Dylan Roof walked into and shot all those folks up uh, several a uh, couple years ago. And, and uh, over, over time, uh, that congregation, Mother Bethel, uh, was a constant kind of bastion of Christian resistance in the face of racial terror. And Mother Bethel had been burned down and bombed many times throughout the years because people like Denmark Vesey and others would 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 call that space as a space of refuge and resistance um, as they followed the ways of Jesus. I would name names like Harriet Tubman, uh, who many folks uh, see her very narrowly as this woman who just were leading folks out of slavery, but she was someone who was acting as an expression of her faith and discipleship in Jesus. I'd even pull some names out, out of our Pentecostal traditions like Bishop Smallwood Williams, who was uh, one of the first uh, 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 bishops uh, in Washington, D.C. They, they actually uh, have all these wonderful uh, 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 collections of, of, of celebration and commemoration of Bishop Smallwood Williams, who during his early career was was advising presidents and helping to create housing for uh, a number of folks who weren't able to afford uh, just a regular kind of lifestyle. His father in the gospel, Bishop Robert Lawson, uh, was out of Harlem, and, and uh, he was uh, doing something very similar and was pastor to folks like Chubby Checker and was a part of the Harlem Renaissance and spoke at the Republican National Convention back in the early 1900s when the Republican Party uh, was the party to abolish slavery. I don't think he'd speak at the Republican National Convention today, amen, unless a lot of repentance and whatnot uh, took place. Uh, and, and you have all these individuals, followers of Jesus, uh, people who were filled with the power of God, using their faith to resist the empire, resist the forces of sin, both personal, social, and uh, structural. And I want to submit to you that some of the most important opportunities you and I will have in this season is to lean into the continued resources of our faith to help us not to bow to the pressures that this moment, this season, and dare I say, daily living would often put upon us to cause us to bend our backs in submission 
rather than standing up in all faith and confidence, knowing that God is faithful to us who are willing to be faithful to God. Make no mistake about it. There is not a moment uh, where the faithfulness of God has not been sustaining us as God's people in history. How many of you know that uh, it's not because of our goodness or our expertise or our wisdom or our connections that we are here today? The scriptures always tell us that it is because of God's unfailing love. Great is God's faithfulness morning by morning. We are here because of the love and the strength and the power of God as a people, as a, as a community. And although many of us can easily see the, 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 the contemporary manifestation of some of these things being called into question, I want to submit to you that even in the face of that, we cannot bow. Uh, I am very much uh, filled with all kinds of anxiety when I uh, get notices like we got that all, some of our immigrant loved ones are just being, being tracked and harassed and chased down the last few weeks. Uh, hundreds of individuals who've been here for years uh, are, are being uh, picked and plucked off their job and from their homes. And uh, people are finding themselves to be just vulnerable. And I do ask some of these questions like, God, what is up? Because I thought we fought that fought a long time ago. But it seems like the bodies of many of our people who follow the ways of Jesus still find themselves vulnerable to the evil of this state. And part of what I take comfort when I read the biblical text is I see, though, uh, that we aren't the first people that have had to contend with this kind of lived reality. That if, if we take God and the scriptures seriously, that God has always had to step in and save his people, sustain his people, encourage his people. That it is not the case that, uh, you know, we click our heels and all of a sudden the world becomes a better place overnight. That the struggles that we face both in the world and in ourselves often require a great process of struggle and preparation and strengthening. But I do see consistently over and over again that when we lean into the power of God, the power of God helps us to stand and stand with victory and confidence. And this is what I want you and I to bear witness of in this moment and in this season. Because it is indeed the case that there is a strange narrative that seems to be rising up in corners of the Christian uh, church, particularly black Christian churches, where folks are calling into question the value of resistance and protest. And folks are saying that we should pray. And they narrowly define prayer as this stationary act where either you are on your knees or in your chair and you are having a talk with God about all the things happening around you. And uh, I find it so fascinating because uh, when you look at the biblical text, uh, the scriptures definitely tell us to pray and the scriptures define prayer as something much more than paralysis or speaking in a radically individual conversation with God. That in the biblical text, you see all kinds of framework of prayer that actually are then pushing us to action. And it is not just action in the public space, but it is also action in our own circle of influence. That I may say, Lord, I'm praying that my children or my marriage or my money or my own mind uh, 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 is well and taken care of, and then I still have to do some things. <laughs> Hello, somebody. Amen. It's quiet this morning. Amen. How many know that 
faith without works is dead. Now, that, that's in the book as well, amen, which means that faith, what you believe and what you do are intricately connected. And yet there are some in this moment who would want to argue that the true church or the true Christian, as I've heard it said by a few folks with some platforms, are to stop protesting, stop publicly uh, uh, resisting and criticizing and just pray. But I want to just give you a couple of thoughts about what the scriptures say, not a few folk who I think may be well-meaning, but I think are misguided, uh, say about how we are to act. Proverbs chapter 31 verse 8 says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Sure that how we refuse to bow is reflective of the integrative uh, tools and practices given to us so we don't bow at all. Because I do believe that when we buy into the fragmentation of, say, neoliberalism or some of these ideologies of the day that focus on capitalistic powers that want to divide us up and cause us to be in constant competition with one another. How many know you can be competing so much with somebody else that you'll start to compete with yourself? And that kind of competition will turn into radical distrust, lovelessness, disconnection, and alienation, rather than us moving in a holistic approach where we're not at war with ourselves or with one another. I'm here to tell you that when we can resist this fragmentation, it creates the possibility for healing, the tools for wellness and wholeness. And this is why I believe what we've read today in the book of Daniel is such an important text because you see that these young folk that have been taken into bondage by a foreign power are now having to live out their faithfulness to God in a foreign, uncomfortable environment. And it is not to suggest, again, that the most foreign and uncomfortable environment is isolated to the political systems of our day. How many of you know there are some situations in our families that are the epitome of discomfort? There are some challenges in our schools. There are some relational uh, ups and downs. There are some physical and emotional ups and downs that require you and I to make sure that when we find ourselves out of our comfort zone, what must I pull from so I do not find myself bowing down to that which God has given us the strength to stand up to? By faith, I will stand in the middle of my trial. By faith, I will stand in the middle of my circumstance and I won't allow that circumstance that is external to me to cause me to lose my faith. No, as a matter of fact, I may find my faith. Hello, somebody. How many of you know sometimes you think you have something until the situation comes? Uh, I was... I was at the bank the other day, and I was trying to deposit some money into this account, and, and I'm rushing, and I'm running out, and I got to my car, and I didn't have my keys. And I thought for sure I had my keys, and I'm pulling up all the stuff. I'm walking, retracing my steps, and I had to go back in the bank, and my keys sitting right there on the counter. I didn't know I didn't have my keys until I went to the car to try to turn the car on. Then I realized, man, I'm missing something. How many of us have ever gotten a situation and you thought you had what you needed until you got into that situation? And it was the situation that revealed. We were talking about this in our Bible study on, on, on Wednesday about all the different voices that 
Scripture have, has had to be interrogated by in order for all of us to appreciate the right and not so accurate interpretations that are often given to us as fact, right? That I'm not a woman, so the scripture saying that women ought to be silent in the church don't affect me. So I'm not going to interrogate that too deeply. I'm going to be like, well, the Bible says if you, if, 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 if you weren't a slave, you weren't going to try to uncover what the scriptures have to say about slavery because that did not impact you that deeply. And all these other categories of sexuality and gender and race and class, if these things don't impact us, how many of you know we don't even know what's, what the scripture is actually missing or inadvertently saying unless we do the interrogation ourselves. And it is that interrogation of our faith that often begins to open up the possibility of salvation and healing and wholeness. But you know what that requires? It requires you and I to lean into those seasons of discomfort. And begin to ask of God that which you may not necessarily see at a first glance. Oh, but God, the more I came back to you and the more I stayed in your presence and the more I refused to bow to these circumstances and factors, I began to see salvation breaking through the clouds and through the darkness of my night and the, 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 the confusion of my presence. And that is the moment I see and believe that the strength necessary to withstand begins to manifest when we lean in and don't bow down. Give your neighbor one more high five and tell them I will not bow. I will not bow. So one of the first things that I think are worthy of our attention, how will we not bow? The, the young men in this moment, the first thing that, or one of the things that I think I'll lift up is that they rejected idolatry. Somebody holler, reject idolatry. Now, it is so important in Romans chapter, uh, our, our study through the book of Romans, we've been talking about how Romans is often a book about idolatry, at least the first couple of chapters. And it measures up with what we've read today, that the young folk are being put in an environment where they must make a decision. Will I bow down to this image, this, this representation of that which is opposite to my God? And, you know, there is often a consequence when you reject idolatry. Hello, somebody. There's often a, a, a penalty that can hang over you if you decide that I will not allow whatever expression of this anti-God to have preeminence and control over my life. It means a few things that I think are worthy that you can't reject idolatry if you don't know the God who you serve. Jesus told the disciples while he was here, who do you say that I am? And I think it wasn't just about their confession for posterity's sake. I think it was about their ability to be clear about Jesus. Because if they weren't clear about Jesus, how many know everybody else's opinions about Jesus would have caused them to probably throw in the towel and walk away? How many of you acknowledge that in the United States of America, the American Trinity is not the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? But the American Trinity, if I were to borrow the words of Martin Luther King, he describes the triplets of evil as racism, militarism, and materialism, that the gods of this country are racism, the ability to diminish others because they have difference. Militarism, the, the, the dependence on violence as the only source of security. And materialism, economic exploitation. And that often we are being asked as a people to bow down to those gods. Not just, again, in a nationalistic sense, but think about how difference 
in our relationships on a personal level are often calling us into a very hard decision about who gets included in my family. I have many conversations with families that are uh, multiracial and, and depending on how many uh, circles of, 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 of familiar contacts you get into, folks will start saying, you know, I can't go to this person's house because, you know, they, they folk don't get along with folk like me or my partner or my spouse or my child. Or you can talk about the many ways that violence, violence both physical, mental, sexual, uh, 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 psychological violence visits our communities. And we depend on this violence to try to help us maintain some kind of control. Or materialism. You and I can become so materialistic that we forget that we're more than our bank account, more than our job, more than the car we drive and the house we live in. That our value is not dictated by the market that is defined by this world, but there is a depth of pricelessness that is about who God created us to be. And we are often being called to bow down at the altars of these gods. And they'll start playing their music. Did we talk about trigger last week? Or was that the week before? I can't remember. We'll get triggered to respond with violence. We'll get triggered when we're stressed out to go on our shopping spree or take advantage of that sale that ain't really a sale. We'll get triggered to fall into conflicts over difference rather than standing up and saying beyond a shadow of a doubt, I know that the God I serve is not defined by the difference is not defined by this violence, not defined by these obsession with material things, but the God I serve is the source of all that is good. The God I serve is a God of peace and justice and sacrificing his own place so you and I can have access to the ultimate place. What does it mean for you and I then to not bow down this week to those forces that are constantly calling us to say yes to them? Sometimes you and I are going to have to make a decision. Say, I, I'm not bowing this time. I'm not bowing this week. I'm going to maintain my commitment to the God who I know has the power, as the Hebrew boy said, to deliver me from the consequence of my faithfulness. Wouldn't it be something if the church really believed that God can deliver when we must reject idolatry? The second thing this text tells us is that we must resist despair. Somebody holler, resist despair. How many of you know the scriptures are clear that you and I may be driven to a place of perplexity, but we are not thrown into despair? You ought to tell your neighbor, I have some limits today. Amen. I, I may be troubled, but I'm not going to be distressed. I may be perplexed, but I'm not going to fall into despair. And how do you and I avoid falling into despair? I think the Hebrew boys teach us through the, the, the work that they were doing with Daniel in the chapters before that they built up enough confidence and power in God that even in the face of this opposition, they were willing to resist despair. They were willing to believe. That even if we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from this furnace. And God will. That's what they said. Now, you, you better know what you know if you're talking about what God's going to do. 
Hello, somebody. It's not like, well, I hope and I believe and I pray and, you know, I'm wishing on a star. No, when you are confident, even in the face of the opposite information, despair will have a more difficult time overwhelming you. But for many of us, we are not as confident about what God is able to do, much less are we confident about what God will do. But time and time again, you ought to have a testimony that you can go back to and can convince you even in the face of opposite information. God has shown me that if I continue to resist this despair, if I continue, listen, in the text, the, the scriptures show that they were answering and resisting together. So one of the ways you resist despair is you got to be in community with folks who are resisting despair. They weren't doing it by themselves. It wasn't Shadrach on one side, of the, then Meshach on the other side, and Abednego bringing up the rear. It's no accident. I believe the biblical text talks about their resistance being together. And that's why we spent this time this morning learning about how and why. We should take care of our healing and wellness together because we can't resist in isolation. The devil, the enemy of your soul, would love to put you in a corner, make you think you're going through this thing all by yourself, make you feel like you're the only one, make you feel like everybody else has, has, has forgotten and thrown in the towel. No, the devil is a lie. I'm going to find at least one or two folk that are going to walk with me and pray and, and, and counsel and, and heal because I know that if we can do this thing together, victory shall be ours. But we have to resist. We have to resist in our practices of faith. We have to make sure that we're continuing to feed ourselves that soul food we've been talking about. Hallelujah. My wife, uh, you know, she always keeping an eye out on what I'm eating whether I like it or not, because she realizes that the only way I'm going to be healthy is if she is helping me to be healthy. How many of you know you need somebody to just peek in on you from time to time, whisper in your ear, don't you go that way, don't you stray off so far, because the God that has called you has also been the God that has called me and us, and I need you to survive this season that we're going through. So your success is intricately connected to my success, and if we can stay together, we will resist the despair that is trying to envelop our families and our neighborhoods and our community in this world. I believe that the same resistance to despair will produce endless hope and possibility for transformation. And then the final thing I'll say is that you and I must keep standing. Somebody holler, keep standing. I love how the Hebrew boys stood there, even in the middle of all of that, that, that kind of group thinking. And they, they, they had to know that when that music sounded, that if they kept standing, they were going to invite all kind of opposition. But I want you to know that when you stand in the power and the strength of God, that God will remind you that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but there is a spiritual power that we are standing against. Uh, and I want you to know today that you are not my enemy. If I can see you, uh, then there's something deeper that I'm standing against. Uh, now, you may be somebody who's trying to, you know, mess up my life and, and get me off course. Uh, but I believe that there's something deeper that I'm standing against. Uh, and it ain't what, what, what it looks like with my own eyes. Uh, I remember in the book of Romans, uh, the Bible 
Bible says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that shall be revealed in us. That all of creation is groaning and waiting for all of those who are the children of God to be revealed to the freedom and the glory of the earth. That God is waiting for somebody to be able to stand up and say, come what will or may, I will stand in the power and the faith of the living God. I will stand and I will not allow Nebuchadnezzar, Donald Trump, the Bank of America, Wells Fargo, ICE and, and, and the immigration services uh, to cause me to bow down in despair or defeat. Uh, but the God I serve uh, is able to do exceedingly uh, and abundantly uh, above all we can ask or think. Uh, there may be a season uh, where I'm going to have to stand in the middle of all of this despair. Uh, but I trust and believe uh, that if God has given me the strength to stand, uh, that God will give me what I need. Uh, so I will not bow down. Uh, what are you trying to say today? Uh, that in your family, uh, you better keep standing uh, on your job. Uh, you better keep standing. In your relationship, you better keep standing on the street. You better keep standing in your mind, in your heart. Don't you dare bow down. God has not abandoned you. God has not forgotten about you. God has not left you alone. But God will come in right on time. Somebody shout hallelujah. Stand. Stand. Having all you've done to do, just stand there and say, I will wait on the Lord until he shows up. Because when God shows up, I shall have victory. I shall have power. I shall have what I need. Stay.